the theme of our, uh, as Yvonne said, talk tonight is power and powerless in the media, powerlessness in the media. And the focus of this discussion is going to be about how recent uh, political and technological developments have changed the ways in which editors and writers go about the, their business and how these developments have altered power relations within publications and between publications and readers. Uh, we will talk for 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Um, and I'm joined tonight from my left uh, by Kasia Veshek, who lives in Warsaw and writes for Gazeta Voborcza. She has been a visiting fellow at EVM and has also written a book about Canada. Uh, to her left is Thomas Chatterton Williams. He's an American who is now living in Paris. He is a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and has been a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. His first book is called Losing My Cool, Love Literature and a Black Man's Escape from the Crowd. And finally, Elizabeth von Tadden uh, is an editor at Die Zeit. She's also been an editor at the Berliner Wochenpost and Berliner Zeitung. So thank you all for, for joining me for this conversation. Um, I'd like to start with a, a very simple question uh, for all of you. Uh, how have recent political shifts altered what gets covered and how it gets covered? This is not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to be the first? Okay, so as I represent Poland, we just moved from being this success story of post-communist transformation to be a living proof that uh, liberal democracy doesn't work in Eastern Europe in the long term. So maybe I can tell you something of how does a, a work, <laughs> journalistic work uh, looks in a country which maybe is not yet authoritarian, but still yet, I would say it's authoritarian curious, or as uh, Viktor Orban memorably put it, it's an illiberal democracy. So uh, if you're expecting uh, heroic stories about journalists who would risk their life or health or income, thankfully, I don't have them yet. Uh, but yes, we have state propaganda, which is bludging uh, its viewers with, um, with state media, which are bludging its viewers with propaganda. Uh, yes, and the journalists who work there, if we st still can call them journalists, uh, were Put, were given a choice either to put up with it or to leave. And many of them stayed because state media pays well and you know private school costs money and you have a mortgage to pay. Uh, but this propaganda isn't convincing. The main news program lost like 40% of viewers in the last three years. So this kind of blunt statements, blunt pro-government statements are counterproductive. Uh, what else? Uh, journalists from private media, yes, they are being sued, but they were being sued before because that's kind of perks of a job and no one was so far jailed. Mm -hmm. And yes, politicians from the ruling party do attack uh, private media routinely, like prime minister would say that 80% of private media is against the government and they're enemies of the people. Or another politician would say that 92% of private media is in German hands, or which is not true by the way. Uh, and work for foreign interests and foreign read German uh, and so on. But it isn't that much different from you know what Donald Trump tweets at 5 a.m. enemies of the people and, and so on. But what is different is uh, that peace government has means to urbanize Polish media. Uh, it often threatens to deconcentrate or to repolonize media. Uh, so it would finally self serve uh, sovereign Polish interest. And the poli peace politicians sometimes allude to the fact that the uh, law which would do it is ready, but it's just waiting for a political decision by Jarosław Kaczyński. And it is waiting because uh, you know, Poland has enough problems with European Union without curbing uh, private media straight, uh, straightforwardly. Plus, they, there was an attempt to punish um, independent or independent TV station for uh, covering the pro protest, but uh, peace government is quite incompetent because this 
media is owned by Discovery, and Discovery is American company, and there was a phone call from State Department, and no one's talking about this fee anymore. Uh, but there are more subtle form uh, of uh, censorship, like showing the media that being for peace has its perks and being against peace has its consequences. Like there, a state-owned company have to make announcements in newspaper with uh, big coverage, like you know the, uh, new contracts or new auctions, and it usually went to my newspaper but not anymore because we want, uh, and it was a big source of revenue in this, this current lousy newspaper market, but not anymore. They all they are go to pro-government press. What else? There is, there, are, there, is, there are trying to secure better treatment from the only media which is perceived as neutral. This is Polsat TV station and its owner has another businesses in energy market and in um, telecommunication markets. So there are talks about they made a deal so that his news station would treat peace more friendly, not outright propaganda, but more friendly and he will gonna have free hand on those markets. So on one hand, we have you know, natural for this liberal regimes uh, with autocratic tendencies, tendencies to push to take over the media to have only one narrative, one dominant narrative with no dissenting voices. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, it, that's an illusion with, with, with the internet, with social media, you can't have one narrative. <laughs> but uh, not. But, but there's, there's a problem, you know, if you take over or close any dissenting media. Of course, you have, can have journalists who are publishing on the internet, but there are two problems. Not everyone would like or have means to find those news, and plus journalists have to eat. So if you don't have independent means, that kind of independent work is, and, well, being a watchdog to power for free isn't a, a long-term option. Uh, but there's also a third side to that, uh, because do, I mean, does this illiberal government really have to control whole narrative? I mean, I was talking quite recently with, with my former colleague who now works for state media, and I asked him, you know, we have this municipal election coming. What if I didn't win? Are we going to punish, you know, um, private media? Are we going to tell that, you know, they told lies? That's the reason why we lost. We have to punish them. And he told me, no, no, there's no, there's no chance we're going to convince your readers. So why should we do it? I mean, why should they do it? Uh, it's better to uh, to leave them be. Uh, what else? Which is okay. I could talk about polarization, but polarization is such a such a cliche. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word used uh, everywhere for explaining everything. But I would like to s say a little bit about this one side of polarization, which is worrying for me because it makes journalists. It's permanently stuck in this game with a very high stakes, which is for both sides of political system. And it requires using tactics and vocabulary which is which wears out easily. You know, the bombastic phrases like big words with capital letters, you know, end of times rhetoric, and it's used by, bo by both sides. And you know, it creates this mood of permanent anxiety and a moral panic which is difficult to maintain. And if you cry wolf too often, nobody would listen to you. If the wolf comes. So my paper, for example, published uh, during election three years ago, we published the headline, stake for this election is democracy. And we are right, right? But, you know, it was published before peace government starts, got power, before they have a chance to prove that, you know, that they are actually trying to do this anti-democratic shift. And it was perceived as sour grapes, as, you know, the uh, elites are fighting with democratically chosen people and and it's you know they didn't convince anyone as i don't think that pro hillary uh, editorials convinced many trump voters not to uh, vote donald trump um, so yeah that's that's about it um, how has um uh, how have political shifts um changed uh, what gets published what gets what gets covered in hell? If we include <coughs> books in the conversation as well as, uh, as well as. <laughs> if if we, if we include books in the conversation as well as magazines, um, just from my own experience, I can I can talk about. Uh, I published my first book in two thousand ten. 
um, kind of coming of age memoir about uh, being black in America and and coming to the growing realization that uh, I was an agent uh, in a country with a history of racism, but that I, I had a degree of control over my own life and could shape my own sense of self. Um, and that was kind of uncontroversial to sell that book and to have major publishers come on board to publish it, even to take it to auction. Um, it was at the, a moment when Barack Obama was ascendant. There was a lot of optimism. About three years after my book came out, um, uh, the movement for black lives um, became a very big um, uh, focal point of activism and kind of uh, made people reevaluate the place of African Americans in American society. And um, what became acceptable to talk about began to change uh, in, the, in, the, in the minds, not just of readers or audiences, but certainly in the minds of gatekeepers and publishers and editors. And so when I came, I don't think I could have sold my, uh, my first book um, after 2013, actually. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that's just a supposition. I, when I brought my second book um, to sell to some of the same editors, and it's a it's, it's it's a continuation of a kind of um, reflection on my life and a, and and a, and a discussion of racial identity through my own experiences and observations. Um, uh, but it's it's an argument against racial identity. It's a kind of it's a it's a stepping out of the black white binary. And I think we're at a time of identity politics and and balkanization of identities where. Um, uh, that's considered uh, outside of the consensus uh, position. And so I would have editors come and tell my agent that um, the writing was fine, they liked the book, they would like to publish it, but it kind of cuts against uh, what the consensus view is now and that, that might not be the right um, position for the house to take and that they would have to pass. And, and that was shocking at first when it happened. And that, so for me, that represents, um, in a tangible way, um, the writing is the same, the, the arguments are the same, but there are windows in which you can, you can uh, certain positions are uh, uh, viable and, and when they are not. And so uh, for, for, for the kind of writing about identity that I do, I, I can see in the past 10 years, there's been quite a shift. And then maybe now we're shifting back to a, to a reopening because I think we got so deep in the, from 2013 to through the Trump election, we got so deep into a kind of identity essentialism that I think a lot of people in the middle are kind of exhausted and are, again, opening up and, 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 and um, wanting to find some type of middle ground. Well, what I can say is quite different because I'm speaking for a huge liberal weekly European newspaper in a still working liberal democracy. But still, I mean, the difference might be interesting then because I'm working in an institution which tries to win trust, not only to keep the trust of its former readers, but to win new trust. And we are definitely we have definitely moved. The clear answer to John's question is yes. These political shifts have altered our work in a deep sense of the word. Um, what has actually happened concretely? Well, first of all, we opened our pages for more conservative voices in order to be more controversial, as controversial as possible, to get as much contradiction as possible. Contradiction and controversy are organized now. Um, the topics have, have changed um, as well. Um, take as an example the huge cover story about a rape we would never have made a cover story about a rape before. It was the rape of a German young woman by a refugee man. And I think you can suspect that we had enormous and vivid controversies inside the newspaper as well, whether we should do that cover story at all. And... Um, <coughs> But the main thing was that it was an investigative, investigative story. And we sent out eight journalists for weeks and months in order to investigate that story. Why do I insist on investigating that story? Because we are 
hardly trying to do what Timothy Snyder was talking about last night. We are trying to, to produce facts. And this is something which has changed. Of course, we have always tried our best to be as factual as ever possible. But now, to write a story like the one about the rapes means a different type of working. We try to be transparent, for example. Every and each huge article like this has now a little transparency article um, published next to it, saying whom did we talk to, how long did it take to write this story, who was who didn't want to to talk to us, um, how long did it take to convince somebody to talk to us. We try to be as transparent as we possibly can, and we gave us guidelines in order to be recognizable for the public. This was a long and very controversial work as well, but now you can read in the internet the guidelines of Die Zeit. Why do I... Well, one more thing actually. We localized our work as well. We went back to the local and to the regions. We have a special edition now um, for Austria, another one for Switzerland, another one for Eastern Germany, and a fourth one for Hamburg, where we um, produce our our um, main edition of Die Zeit, um, but this all these things are easy to say um, because the uh, company, the owner of Die Zeit, is one of the most prominent media companies in in Europe. So I know well it is all a question of money, and the independence which we try to keep. Um, as an expression of the political shifts, um, of course, depends on money as well, but not only on money. We have been thinking so hard about our job, about the job we do, and sometimes it seems to me as if the main shift was fighting the objection that we produce fake news and that we are what Germans call Lügenpresse. The quality press has been challenged so hardly that we did all we could and still do in order to reject these um, objections. So the whole profession has changed in a very deep way and, um, well, I hope we, um, we go a good way. Was there uh, any debate on the staff about the introduction of these, uh, this uh, sidebar about transparency? Like putting that in the public instead of keeping that as a principle among the staff, but mm. not letting the public know about There's it. There's a huge controversy on everything. And days are very long now because nobody agrees on nothing. And that feels very vivid and that feels very passionate. And it is a great experience to go through. But it is very tiring as well. So there is colleagues who say, we won't do that transparency thing. That is... Um, a step too far towards in, in the reader. Way? A step too far towards the reader, ah, because okay. um, it would just hurt our professional eth ethos um, to tell our well t to tell our mysteries to people who have to trust us. I mean, a doctor wouldn't say, wouldn't tell the um, patient anything about um, what he's doing, but keep some things for himself, but we decided to be as transparent as ever possible. And I mean, I, I first thought that you were asking me the question how I thought about the editorial, which we now printed on the first page of the site. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. For the first time in the history of our newspaper, the chief editors apologized for an article which was printed on the third page of the previous edition was what had happened. Um, we had decided that we would publish a controversy on the distress rescue, the voluntary distress rescue on the Mediterranean Sea. Should people um, be allowed to rescue refugees on the Mediterranean or should it be forbidden? And we had one article in favor of the refugee rescuing on the Mediterranean Sea and one article against it. And the headline overall was um, Sollen wir es einfach lassen? Should we just stop rescuing them? And our readers reacted by a shitstorm. It was amazing how 
furiously got about this headline. So the headline actually was the reason why finally the chief editors wrote and apologized on the first page of the site. But this is to say we started to be a breathing newspaper. Dialoguing is now 50% of the job and we are in a permanent discussion with our readers now. We might go deeper into that transformation later on, but this is what is the main transformation of the job, that um, we now talk about the mistakes we make, that now we um, even, um, well, and there's readers who say, but you are authorities, you are gatekeepers, you are not supposed to apologize for what you do, you have to stand for it. So that that's the controversy. That, that's that's interesting because you're you're talking about how the newspaper has recognized that its per perception of its authority has changed, mm -hmm. and that it needs to do things very transparently to shore up that sense of authority. So, uh, Thomas and Kasha, have you uh, found as writers over the last three or four years that you've asked yourself about your own sense of authority and? Uh, have you sensed it wane? I mean, Tom, you do reporting as well. Um, have you sensed the need to shore it up somehow because you, you, you sense that your audience has shifted or you want to reach a different kind of audience that previously you weren't aware of? Or has it become much more prominent now? I haven't changed uh, trying to, which audience I try to <coughs> reach, excuse me. But um, I do find that the way that the um, industry works with the elite publications that you basically want to w work for, especially to do reporting and things like that, is there's a tacit kind of um, understanding of what's acceptable there. And so you end up kind of um, catering to that even against your your own will as a writer, even if you think you're being a, a bit contrarian. You end up, to publish a piece in The New Yorker, you have to write your piece in a way that can be published in The New Yorker. And so I had the experience of... Um, and I, and I really admire The New Yorker, and I loved the experience of writing there, but I, I was reporting on the far right in France and the influence of the far right on the alt-right in America. And I decided <coughs> I was in Italy, and I wanted to go to a town outside of Florence called Prato that is extraordinarily um, Chinese now. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, one of the most important textile um, um, villages in the history of Italy, and and it used to be where it, it used to be the pride of Italy for Italian textile manufacturing, and now it's essentially um, Chinese textile manufacturing. Um, and I just thought that this was, you know, when you're presenting, um, and I consider myself a liberal, but when you're presenting people who believe that demographic change in Europe is very important, and and when you're pre when you're presenting them as uh, your their point of view. Um, I think it's important to paint a picture of some of what is exciting them um, and to allow a reader, an, an intelligent reader, to make conclusions about that without editorializing it um, or holding their hand through it. I quickly, through the editing process, um, became aware that if the piece were to be published, um, no one told me this, but if the piece were to be published, that scene had to come out because implicitly it lent support to an argument that uh, it, it, I think the comment in the margins was, it's not clear enough where um, your sympathies lie, um, which kind of really, really scared me, uh, to be honest, you know? Um, because I didn't think that my job was, uh, I write op-eds sometimes where I am arguing a point, but I was reporting a piece, I'm not, uh, I'm a black man living in Paris, I'm not uh, in favor of uh, the, the, the Nouvelle Droite, but I also think that if you pretend that they have no um, arguments that can resonate, that, then you're going to miss um, what's going on. Had you written for the New Yorker previous to this piece? For the print, that was my only piece for the print magazine. Okay, but for the website, for the website you, I have. And the the, uh, the question of same same. I had it from a different angle. But <laughs> actually, I have problems, I guess, at the New Yorker. But I also the the website um, uh, fifty fifty one piece worked fine, and one piece. Um, did cut against the editorial tone, and eventually I withdrew it because it was never killed, but um, it kind of just languished, you know? And I ended up publishing it in the London Review of Books. So there's a question of them not being clear where your sympathies were, and so 
you didn't. Yeah, it's, and it's never, the thing is that you have a certain degree of uncertainty as a writer and then you self-correct, anticipating what, if you want to get your piece published, you anticipate what will make it publishable in ways that maybe this has always been the case, but it seems that now with social media, the, the backlash and the repercussions are so much more severe than when it was a letter to the editor. So the editors are more sensitive to, you know, making sure that, uh, <clears throat> that they don't invite that backlash. So the whole thing seems to really like work at warp speed and to reinforce itself in my experience. Uh, Kasha, this question of, of your sense of authority as a, as a writer and reporter, has that shifted at all f for you in the last four or five years? Well, I would ask if there is any sense of authority for a journalist. You know, there's this digital news report by Reuters, <laughs> and I checked it, they, uh, and uh, I, this, those are numbers for Poland, but they're not the worst. So 48% 40, of Poles trust the information they got from the media, and just 55% trust the information from the media they like and read. You know, 34% avoid the news altogether because they think that either media is lying or news is going to put them into a bad, bad, bad mood. So, you know, if only half of people trust the media, a little more than half trust the media they like, and a you know, little less than half avoid news altogether. And it's not just Poland. In the US, I think 34% of people trust the media. So what kind of authority are we speaking of if, you know, half of people think we are lying, basically? And, you know, there's this wave of distrust to many public institutions, and, you know, media are not that bad. Politicians are still way, way uh, lower. Uh, but, you know, we are not seen anymore as people who would speak truth to power, but we are seen as uh, allies of power. And yes, especially in authoritarian regimes, uh, media can be, uh, like, in Hungary, when I was told, like, 90% of media market is uh, vassalized by Viktor Orban. But, you know, even, uh, even if in democracies, journalists are seen just, you know, as a part of uh, hated elites, which is <laughs> also kind of funny because we are not more and more... We're not the elites, uh, and digital revolution made our jobs more precarious. Newspaper are cutting, uh, new, newspaper publishing revenues are getting low. Uh, print advertising plunged. And my newspaper, for example, went for from 500,000 copies in pre-digital digital age to 90,000 now, which is a huge plunge with all the consequences you probably all know, laying layoffs and uh, cutting, especially investigative department, opinions, well, opinions cheap. Uh, fastest growing uh, business in my p uh, parent company, Agora, which owns my paper, it's not my newspaper anymore. We are, we are, we are very losing business. Fastest growing business is uh, selling tickets to cinemas they own. Uh, so, and you know, and it's also the loss of prestige. You, uh, back then, when you hit the uh, main newspaper in your country, you were someone. Uh, yeah, you had a voice, uh, people would listen to you, and you were paid considerably, considerably well, and not anymore. I remember like five years ago, uh, one of my colleagues uh, on, on his blog wrote that it's outrageous that you know, he's, uh, he works in number one Polish newspaper, so it's like he was playing R Real Madrid, and he cannot afford to take his wife to Frankfurt Marathon. And this is outrageous, he doesn't agree with that. So just <laughs> we don't write that, that stuff anymore, but it was the attitude. Like, you know, we should be considered someone better. So I don't know, there's also one thing which, in terms of how we interact with our readers, really bothered me. There was this, news, there was this conference on the future of, of journalism in Warsaw. So I think it's a very popular topic right now. And we're talking about this project called Spięcie, which means clash, but with a sparks. And this is a pretty interesting project because five venues, smaller ones, intellectual ones, representing uh, from, uh, very far from the left through liberals to right, Christian right, uh, they, uh, they pick a topic like, like pensions or like constitution and they pick an author, each and every venue picks one author, and you know, they, they write five pieces, and those five pieces are published in each and every one. So the readers of those, uh, those uh, websites has, have um, access to five different points of view, which is rather rare nowadays. So we're talking about this project, and there was this American journalist who asked the guy who, who invented this project, but you know, how, how do you 
how do you justify it to your readers? Because if I had this close cooperation with right-wing readers, my Twitter followers would ostracize me, they would eat me, they would, you know, they would stop following me. And this is sad because, you know, we don't have to be independent, not only from, from, the, uh, from the government or from big business, but we have to also be independent from our own readers. It's, you know, it's my voice. It's not, I, I, I'm not just a tube for some aggregated readers, right? Uh, picking up on that, Elizabeth, you were talking a, m a minute ago about um, how editorial changes have been made to shore up the paper's authority. Uh, has the paper only done that within the paper, or has it tried to do that outside of the paper? Well, yes, and I mean, this is more or less a, di a direct answer to what Kasha said. Um, we have to remain independent from our readers, yes. This is always my first paragraph and whatever I say, that whomever I meet, I always say, but attention, I might write very critically about you tomorrow. Um, I'm not your friend, I'm a journalist, but we go towards our readers. And this is a new strategy of my newspaper, which I do support, which I find the right thing to do, but which has maybe its price, and we don't know the price yet. But the thing is interesting. We decided to become an actor in the democratic arena and strengthen deliberation as an active participant in the debate. This means that I'm just coming from a conference where we invited two thousands of our readers, Two thousands of our readers came and we discussed with them not only what a newspaper is or should be, we discussed with them what the common good is, what a good life is. Um, I organized a new type of discussion, a criti critical reading of new books. We chose Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now and discussed 300 readers and me what this book was about, a new type of critical um, reading or reviewing a book. So, of course, this is very controversial as well. Me personally, I think it is the right thing to do. I always tell all these readers that, um, I'm, a that I'm a critical journalist and will do my job wherever I go, but still we have the feeling that trust building means meeting people vividly not in the digital world, exchanging arguments, contradicting lively, hearing what people say, and in a way, this is my point of view, coming back to the very beginnings of pre-democratic enlightenment in Europe, where in the year 1784, Carl Philipp Moritz said, a journal has to go towards its readers as citizens of the town of the polis and consider them as agents, not only as readers, in order to strengthen their agency and in order to got enlightened by their critique as well. So this is the way we chose, and um, keep your fingers crossed um, that um, independency w won't be damaged. It depends on our readers as well. I'm curious, what were some of the arguments at the paper made against doing this? Well, first of all, we are a couple of hundreds of different voices. So, um, and this diversity is everything. Um, this is our capital, this diversity. So I can't quote 700 voices, but um, the, um, I find this point of diversi diversity and controversialism so important. The, Arguments against it were the arguments Kasia just mentioned. We have to keep our distance. Our job is the critical distance to the, so to the society we have to write about, and we don't have to mix up with people we are, to, we are writing about. This is the main argument. Of course, the second argument is very simple. It says we are a, market, uh, a brand on the market, and all we want to do is to be bought and read. So it is all more or less well hidden merchandising what we are doing and um, this is um, inadequate. Um, it, it, we have no legitimation whatsoever 
to appear in the democratic sphere and say that we want to act in a, f in a sphere without being deputies of this public sphere. But um, all this is true to my mind. And still, I would say, if you are clear and transparent on the way you're speaking, and that you're not, um, that you don't go on the markets in order to sell your newspaper, but because you're deeply worried about democracy and deeply worried about the problems we face at present, this is a different thing. And um, I would always say it is very un inconvenient and it is a lot of work to travel through the country and go on local markets in order to engage discussions. It is really not, a, n not only a pleasurable thing and people, um, well, I think they, they feel it. They feel it that we, that we are worried about democracy. Now, this is a, a question for all of you. Uh, changes like this and some of the others you've spoken about, um, do you see them as, as tactics for the times? Or have they uh, given you pause and maybe prompted you to reconsider whether or not we should have been doing something like this all along? Uh, engaging with readers more directly yeah. or uh, changing the way stories are presented, uh, significant changes in the way the news is presented to a reader either in print or in this case in person. Is this just a, a, a defensive measure f until the, the, the political climate changes or is the, do you see this as something permanent and maybe should have been permanent long ago. I think it was Timothy Snyder who said last night that um, societies should have um, become aware earlier that newspapers have to be strengthened, that they don't have the, the, the um, power by themselves to survive in um, a digital world. This is partly true. I think we should have started it earlier. And I think um, we should have tried to um, found endowments, trust-like um, helpings, financial helpings for all these newspapers who can't afford it themselves. Um, but the dialogue with society, to my mind, is the um, logic consequence of what has been enlightened journalism before. The dialoguing journalism, to my mind, is what fits best in a democratic society. But of course, we have to do the job nevertheless. We first have to write the articles, and we first have to print them, and then discuss them. So it's the double work, so we need the double of, of the staff. And um, the one will never be a substitute for the other. So uh, it take, for me, it takes uh, to, to write an article um, w with a substance um, which I think can be published needs a couple of weeks to be written and um, then discuss it afterwards with the public means another couple of weeks so and the day has 24 hours so it is just a new workload that is all well uh, we live in a world, thanks to digital revolution, of a democratization of communication and content and this is the reality and there's you know, no use to take offense with that and you know in around quarter of century, I think, we moved from the word of Gutenberg, right, the com communication which was one to many. Uh, we do model, you know, the limited number of centralized uh, communicators, uh, big newspapers, big TV stations, radio stations, in which uh, cost of broadcasting was also high. You could either own the station or you could work for the station. There was no, no other way if there was before the internet. And now we move to well Zuckerberg's world of many to many communication, you know, where anyone can publish any content their heart desire, and if it's interesting enough, you know, the Twitter will make it viral. And you know, social media is the alerted the dynamics of distribution. There are no gatekeepers anymore, and the race is open. Uh, established media have to compete with uh, smaller venues, or even with bloggers, YouTubers, uh, and active Twitter users. And in this new media environment, there is no you know, assumed authority. There is no Walter Cronkite who would tell you how it is. 
And there's, you know, communication is not one-sided anymore. It's not like I do the speaking and you do the listening. I am active, you are passive. And if you don't like what I say, you can, pr you can send a letter to editor, print it, printing not guaranteed, right? <laughs> So the relationship with the audience had to change. It had to become more democratic and less hierarchical. And this shift, of course, has its advantages. First, uh, journalists and media outlets cannot become complacent. Uh, it's a theory. You know, competition should force mainstream media to strive for excellence, to be constant, constantly reinvent themselves, to look for a better way to reach new audience and to keep the old ones. Uh, secondly, uh, internet enables us to interact with the audience. You know, sometimes, of course, it bruises your ego when someone in the comment section or Twitter proves that he or she knows better on, on any given subject than you do. That happens. But, you know, in the older days, we would stay in a blissful obliviousness. Now, not anymore. But, you know, it also enables you to cor correct your mistakes, uh, to be better next time, and to stay humble. And, you know, also, if you're lucky, you can also get a certain scoop for, for the audience, for your readers. Uh, also, uh, you know, it shows in a way that, that this pre-digital one-sided journalist could never do what really interests our audience, what kind of stories do they like, uh, what find they find exciting and worth sharing. But those are the good sides, but it's not all roses, unfortunately. You know, what it turns out that your audience is more interested with a video with a guy on a kayak which was being hit by a seal with an octopus. And I kid you not, Google it, but not now, please. This is a great video. I was, I was laughing on, on the way on the Warsaw Airport very loud. Or if we switch to American politics, what if readers are more interested in graphic details of Donald Trump's anatomy described very vividly by Stormy Daniels than graphic details of his administration described less vividly by Bob Woodward, right? So shall we focus more on seal videos and on scandals uh, to, be, to gener generate clicks and shares? I think that's a, that's a question maybe more editors <laughs> ask themselves than, uh, than journalists, because you know, chasing clicks can dumb down journalism. I just find it very disturbing and scary, the, the development. And we talked a bit about Ian Baruma at the New York Review of Books today. Um, but the, the story that was even a little bit more scary to me was uh, what happened with David Remnick at The New Yorker, and he didn't lose his job, but he lost an extraordinary amount of authority, I think. Uh, and I, I think that once you... Can you read, can you read yeah, the I will, story? I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Once, but once you lose a certain amount of authority, it doesn't just walk back. Um, so The New Yorker Festival uh, is not exactly an article, but he, the editor-in-chief is organizing The New Yorker Festival and inviting guests. And David Remnick, um, the editor-in-chief of The New Yorker, um, decided he would interview Steve Bannon. Um, uh, and interview him aggressively is how he described his plans for the exchange. Um, and then readers and some guests like Jim Carrey and Judd Apatow and then some junior staff members of The New Yorker said, no, that's not acceptable. At for, Remnick held for a few hours and then, and then, and then he reversed himself and he released this letter that was kind of very scary because it was about a page and a half long and the first 90% of it was a very well-reasoned argument for why you engage someone uh, with ideas that you may even find repellent and you interrogate them and you expose their ideas to the light of sun. And then the last paragraph was, but well-meaning subscribers and, and some of my junior staff felt very strongly that this was the wrong thing to do so we're not going to go for it. And then some people said on Twitter, well, Twitter is now effectively the editor-in-chief of The New Yorker. That is who edits The New Yorker now. And it's hyperbole, but it's also not completely wrong. Well, how does that, how does that, you're a writer, so how does that... So as a writer watching that on, on Twitter, just observing, it's, it's a message about what's acceptable. The window is closing about what type of stories The New Yorker stands for, what type of opinions are allowed in, what type of... Um, ideas will be entertained. Some people were saying that you know the New Yorker Festival is nothing to worry about. It's just it's just a festival. It's entertainment. But I think that these things, that these symbols, and these kind of exchanges and how they play out actually uh, mean a great deal more than just um, oh it's one festival. It's no big. I think he really lost authority that day 
and the institution did, and we don't have too many institutions. We don't have any institution like the New Yorker anymore. That's that's a that's sui generis. There's no other magazine like that in America, and for that to falter, for that to be um, subject to uh, you know reversals dictated by by the mob, uh, it ma it it makes me what scared. About, what about what about the counter arguments from some of the people on the staff? Why why this person? Already has a, a bullhorn. Why give him a, another? Why give him a platform in front of a, a different audience just to say what he has been saying about politics for the last three or four years? I don't think that uh, Steve Bannon says many interesting things or, or needed to be invited in the first place. But once an editor in chief makes a decision to invite him, he's invited, and and and, and it's the the real weakness comes in the reversal. I think, and that's where the damage was done. It could have easily been avoided by not inviting him in the first place, and then you have to wonder why um, the editor is so out of touch with his readership and his uh, and his staff to not anticipate the type of backlash that happened. But once the invitation is out, the reversal, um, dictated by uh, people who are not the editor, who are literally not uh, at that level of authority, it, it concedes too much, and I think that. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a new space that we're in right now. And you know, you're seeing it in several instances, but this one was the one that really shook me. Uh, have you seen something similar to this in your newsroom at all? Well, it's most disturbing what you're saying. And I think you are right to stress the fact that a chief editor has to be a chief editor. Um, else how, there is no difference any longer between the fourth power which the press is, and the fifth power, which society is. But having said this, I would still like to say that our experiences with the fifth power, which is the professionalized critical citizen as a reader, who now controls the press and tells us how he thinks about our work, I think this is a necessary step to take in the improvement of democracies, but not in order to see humiliations of chief editors as you have just described them. My idea and my hope would be that the fifth power can strengthen the authority of newspapers once our decisions are taken, once our decisions are transparent, once we give good reasons for our decisions after having debated with the fifth power, with society, I would hope that our authority would be broadened and would be um, strengthened. And so I have not seen any case like you, ju you just have described, and I don't want to see those, actually. I don't want to see a chief editor constrained or haunted or hunted um, by, you rightly said, the mob, um, and to release an invitation which he had pronounced before. But um, I remember very well writing a long essay on the free speech and the question, whom do we talk to, Democrats, and whom don't we? And while I was writing it, while I was writing it, there was the news popping up that Alexander Gauland, the chief of the German populist IFD, had been invited to Vienna, to the Burg Theater, and people were wondering, whether this was a good idea or not. So the question is popping up without an end, and it is constantly a challenge. You will never close that dossier and say that you're through with it. We will have to re-deliberate it on any occasion. Who is the people who has the right to speak and who is not? And as they want to blame us for being the system, I always think that those who want to destroy the system, those who want to destroy democracy, are people whom I'm not going to talk with. But all those who want to improve democracy are very welcome. But I know how difficult it is, what I'm saying, because we have been discussing all these different concepts of democracies today. Sovereign democracy, liberal democracy, liberal democracy, people's democracy. So. What kind of democracy are we talking about? The one thing I want to keep 
um, is the chief editor, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. One thing that also comes to mind is that the Economist also invited Steve Bannon to their festival, their 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 conference, and um, there were calls for them to resend the invitation as well. But the editor in chief of the Economist said no. Uh, that was it. I made the decision. He's still coming, and in fact, the Economist still works. It, it, and 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 it's kind of it, it shows that you can still say no. I I make an I make this decision, and the world continues, and the Economist still is on the shelf over there, and. It still has readers, and it will survive. But 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 the, these kind of these points at which you draw a line, I think that they matter. I also I had recently an argument with someone. What's the difference between banning uh, Milo ya I can Yanapolis yeah from Berkeley uh, and banning Alex Jones from uh, from YouTube and from uh, Facebook and other uh, social media. And, you know, instinctively, I am for banning Alex Jones because he's a conspiracy theorist who made a lot of people suffer because he's, for example, he, he says that Sandy Hook didn't happen and he sent all those crazy people to Sandy Hook parents. But what's the difference? And I think the difference is that if you give Alex Jones voice on YouTube, he's not being contradicted. Uh, he just can send his toxic thoughts uh, uh, to the internet and people will just listen, it's one-sided communication. But if you, uh, if you allow someone like uh, Milo to go to Berkeley, you can always contradict him. You can always say it's bullshit. You can always, you know, you can always find better arguments than he has. You, I think you should at least try to do it because if you don't, you just give him away and give him a satisfaction of being uh, martyred of uh, free speech, which is also <laughs> funny. I think this is a, a good point to turn the mic over to the audience for, for questions. Okay. I have a question to Elizabeth. Um, when we talked about, when you just mentioned uh, Milo and Berkeley, uh, which is a younger generation than uh, probably most readers than the site has. Is there a difference, generation-wise, uh, in the approach of readers to the discussions that you're introducing to them? And is there a greater reluctance of the older ones uh, to be told to discuss with you? <laughs> there is no difference, and this is the news I'm most proud of. Um, the best news I can give you is that there's no difference. The young readers are treated by us exactly in the same way as the elder readers are. And the audience is mixed. Um, if you ask me today what my definition of happiness is, it was last Saturday's experience to see that in a huge arena with about 500 people, there were all ages of readers and um, they came voluntarily. So, um, the, um, I, might ask, I might, might answer the question differently one day, but today I would say I can't see the problem. I also have a question that I find very interesting, uh, this discussion uh, uh, and seeing myself uh, much more on the side of the economist than the New Yorker. Because it creates the following story. You know, President Trump said, I'm not going to take the questions from New York Times or from Washington Post. I don't like them. The questions that they ask me offend me. And what is the response? We basically, Stephen Bannon is a very ugly personality who is part of the public debate. And I do believe this is the trauma of the American media who took the guilt believing that they invite, simply elected Donald Trump by covering him. And he, I'm very much interested in this because I do believe that, as you know, sociological data shows the following. The higher your education is, the more tolerant you are when it comes to religion, when it comes to ethnicity, uh, to this type of differences, but more intolerant you are when it comes to people with a different political views. And I do believe we start to treat people who disagree with us as people who offend us. And this is becoming an excuse for governments to start to treat media 
in the same way. So from this point of view, I'm interested in these reflections. What do you believe is going to become? If scared after, if one David Remnick cannot invite Stephen Bannon, who of the liberal publications are going to dare to do this? What is going to happen if in the next two or three years you stop one by one inviting all these people whom you don't like? Is it not going to become the same what is in Facebook? You are defriending everybody who does not like you. Uh, well, that's yeah. That's thing I'm also very much worried about because in my country, media are divided by half pro-government, anti-government, and you know if you try to talk to the other side, you're considered a traitor. We have this word sym symmetrist. Uh, and this is a you know worst curse that, than anyone because you know you're getting from both sides. But you know, I mean, this we are more and more entrenched in our bubbles and less prone to open. And you know, I, I'm not Pollyanna. I I don't think that uh, you know when you have on one hand forces which want to I don't know which are racist or want to take out take women's rights or are anti-democratic, and on the other side you have forces which are have different opinions, but the truth lies somewhere in between, because it doesn't. But, you know, on the other hand, we cannot put... I mean, when I when I look, when I read right-wing media in Poland, you know, their narration about us, it's, you know, they are all either cynical or uh, useful idiots. And it's the same narration of we have about them. And yeah, of course, some of them are <laughs> cynical or very useful idiots, but it doesn't keep us closer to uh, reaching their audience because you know that it's like you cannot put half of your population into a basket of deplorables because they're gonna still be there and what you, you, California will secede and East Coast will secede and the uh, rest of the uh, US gonna s s be pro Trump. I, I mean it's one country you have to find a way to talk to each other at least maybe not convince but at least see a, see a human being in, in person which disagrees with you because now it's being more and more dehumanizing you're uh, you're making the point that I think is so uh, missed oftentimes everybody that I knew who wrote for the New York Times and the New Yorker was shocked when Donald Trump won including myself and that's because we don't know how many people are listening to someone like Steve Bannon? So I think Remnick was right in the logic that he outlined for why he thought to invite him, which is that you need to exp you need to be aware. Uh, he is part of the debate whether you like it or not. You're just not listening to part of it. And this, but the people who are listening are, are not going to go away because you close your ears. So I think it's pretty uh, it's pretty straightforward why you need to you need to be um, having as much open exchange and uh, and actually um, defeating some of these noxious ideas. Um, and not just merely uh, insulating yourself from them, because you can't actually insulate yourself from them. Um, hi there, I'm Lexi Alexander from South Africa. Um, I want to pursue this question of who are we talking to, uh, and ask the speakers uh, if they could address it in terms of what is really the key social issue that we face in the 21st century, and that is one of very high inequality and growing inequality. Because um, I think it's not enough to say we want to communicate more with the public and to have meetings of 500 people, although that's obviously a very good thing. We do have to give thought to who those 500 people are. Because if we're not careful, it tends to reinforce an existing liberal consensus or a particular kind of political position. Now, if I could just say about South Africa, there's no way in which my centre would be able to organise a meeting such as this because we have to be aware of the way in which most people are very, very poor. They live on the margins of the big cities. If we're to have a genuine public meeting, then we have to organize transport for people to come from those poorer areas. And I wonder sometimes about the meeting that we had yesterday, marvelous as it was, it was fantastic for me to listen to Tim Snyder and to see what was happening in Austria. But to what extent was it excluding people? To what extent was it excluding poorer people, blacker people, immigrants and so on? And and so forth. Because if we are excluding through our practice, not necessarily through our intentions, but through our practice, then surely we're undermining democracy. And if we're undermining democracy, aren't we then providing fertile ground for the kind of populists who everybody here seems to be denigrating? So I'm wondering if the speakers could say what they do through their own practice 
to overcome the problems of massive inequality and the way in, it, in which it impacts on the kind of voices that are heard inside the media. Because what I see, not only in South Africa, but in the international media as well, is very little credibility given to ordinary people. Okay, sometimes the BBC will interview an ordinary person who is involved in some catastrophe. Mm -hmm. But they're there as vox pops. They're there without a name. The people who have the names are the politicians. They're the business people. They're the celebrities and so forth. So how do we overcome that problem? How through our well-established public media, who uh, have some degree of credibility, do we deal with this particular problem? Because if, I, if we don't, then I think we can get to this situation that you're talking about in Poland, where the media lacks credibility, and that lack of credibility increases, and it undermines even further democracy. I totally agree with what you say. And um, I would very much like to be able to tell you now that I'm traveling through the countryside, speaking with the disprivileged all day, and engaging discussions with them, and no, that would be a lie, of course. We started with our readers. But what I would very much like to do as a second, third, fourth step is exactly that. Travel to the countryside, go to every school, every hospital, go wherever I can on stations, engage people in discussions. What last happened when I went to one of these East German villages, I spoke to a teacher asking him how he was thinking about our idea of opening the debating arena to our readers. And this teacher, it was just one of the small villages in East Germany which are so depopulated at present because people go to the towns and look for work in the towns. Um, and what he said was, but I can't, I don't speak your language. And um, well, this is what I'm traveling on since he told me that he's reading my newspaper. He is a reader of my newspaper, but he told me, I can't, I don't speak your language. So it's a whole translating job, empowerment job, which we will have to do. And um, I agree with you, This, all the work has to be done. We haven't even started yet. As for, for me, I agree with the concern you have about inequality and what it means for democracy and open society. I'm just not sure that's what writing does. The, uh, what do I do? Writing is trying to think very seriously about issues and subjects and, and to express responses to those ideas and subjects as clearly as you possibly can. I, and that might be all that writing does. Then you have advocacy, you have activism and other things. But, that, but, but I'm, in my writing, I'm just trying to write as well as I can and as honestly as I can. Well, I agree with you, but we are failing. It's structural also because, you know, the, uh, when the newspapers start losing revenues, I think what got cut first was all the legwork, that is investigating department or local uh, bureaus. So now most job we do is just sitting in our Warsaw office and writing mostly opinions. Uh, because, of, as I said, opinions. No, I mean, it's really, it's for me, it's more and more self-referencing because when I read yet another polemic with an opinion to was a polemic to another opinion, it's just like, I mean, who cares? Who cares about our own Warsaw bubble? Who cares about uh, you know, Twitter followers or our, our, our colleagues from different uh, different media? Uh, so yeah, I, I I I'm failing. I, I what what can I do? I I know I can I, I can interview some expert on what on uh, basic income or why uh, Bill Gates is an outsource outsourcing saving the world to Bill Gates. It's not the best idea or how you know income inequality is uh, threatening life on Earth. Well, global warming, but income inequality also is, is skyrocketing. I try I try not to look down on people. I mean, you know, in Poland, um, we, uh, uh, there was this stipend for uh, uh, children with two kids or more, and they got this 500 zlotys per, per month, which was 
big sum of money for someone and we have a wave of articles that's going to destroy economy and you know those poor people who got those money went for the very first time for summer holidays and now they are destroying our beaches they are p pissing on our beaches or you know they are behaving in a I mean, it was so full of contempt to you know to to regular people you know to, to those who are who are not reading us who you know who, who authors of the story thought they are basically better because you know they're educated and they know that if you go to the beach you should use toy toy not not bush so i mean i try <laughs> i try to say i mean it's okay it's not saving the world right but i at least i try not to uh, be offensive small program small step no, no, no. thank you i could contribute a practical example. Uh, I was um, with the students in um, a certain sport arena and there was a Chinese student and then he finally said he's, he's very tough the prices here and so I invited him to live with me in my flat. Uh, then my son also lived in my flat and uh, his colleague student uh, reported him that he has difficulties in all the ways. So he invited him too. So finally we had two persons invited, not paying for the flat anyway, but very friendly. And we said, however, it is a non-smoking area, especially my son insists in that. Though after a few weeks, the student colleague did not comply to the, to the rule and smoked. And uh, after a few days and a few weeks, I finally asked him, please give me the key back for the flat. What would you have done in this case of inclusion? Uh, well, I would ask if a flat has a balcony. If it has a balcony, go to a balcony. Well, smoke outside. It is just a small example for the big example. You understand? <clears throat> yes, my name is Alex Ratzinger. I have uh, one question. You mentioned the loss of trust. Uh, and uh, I remember being in a meeting in, in Phoenix, Arizona, where the, the uh, CEO of Intel said, well, trust, you have to define trust. Uh, much, much more because, for example, I would at that point, Clinton uh, was in power, he said, I would, I would trust President Clinton with my country, but I wouldn't trust him with my daughter. Uh, and uh, so the question is, what, what is it, what, what is the trust that you're looking for? Because as readers, as a reader, I'll always be skeptical about everything I read. Okay, I won't, I won't eat. so that that's one one thing. And the, the another question, if I may, is if you always talk to your own readers, but not to other readers of other newspapers, don't you feel that you become a kind of groupthink uh, purveyor and mm, encourager? Thank you. Okay, so I think that's a very basic level of trust, but trust that I'm doing my best to fulfill my duty, how, you know, it sounds very big words, but, you know, basic journalistic duty, that is to try to uncover truth as best I can, to give you facts and differ them from the opinions. And, you know, of course, I cannot be totally objective, it's impossible, I have views but I can express them in opinion section, not in news section. And that, you know, I'm not covertly working for some politician and I try to speak truth to power, in other big words, not to, not to be, not become a t propaganda tube for power. Well, trust is for me that both sides all sides make serious efforts to agree on what they are talking about in order to make sure that they're not simply listening to what the other one says, that they can resonate with what the other one says. And this means that you trust in that he is seriously trying to 
agree on the basis you're talking about. Otherwise, you can't create any resonance if you just if just everybody speaks. You would just have 80 million German voices to be heard, but no kind of dialogue of resonance and of opinion making. And this is a lot because I don't know what your experiences are, but my experience is that it, it becomes quite rare to agree on the facts you're talking about, to frame them in the same way and to illustrate them in a, con in a way which is meant to be convincing, which is meant to reach the other one and not only to close your own shop. Um, and the other answer is, of course, this is my major fear. We, I want to talk to the city and not to my readers only. I want to engage a discussion with the city, with the polis. Um, but, I mean, you can't have all at the same time. So this is the first step. And it is not easy to discuss with such a, such a huge number of differently um, perceiving people. And even 500 side readers are perceiving differently, have different profession, different um, places they live in, different bi biographical experiences. So this is difficult enough. Um, but I agree, it would even be better to exchange views of different readers and um, different communities. We'll make that next step one day, sure. Um, I think you earn trust as a publication by treating readers as adults and telling them things even that they don't want to hear that are unpleasant for them to hear. And you do that over the course of the long term and you earn trust. Uh, Breitbart News tells its readers only what they want to hear and excludes everything that contradicts their worldview. And they have enthusiasm, they have support, but I don't think that they have what I would define as trust from their readers because their readers must on some level know that they're not getting a whole world. Uh, the New York Times does get trust because I think it messes up, but it, it acknowledges as best it can when it messes up and it tells its reader things, it, tells it, it treats its readership as, in, as adults. And I think that's the best that you can do. Um, I think I have the impression we all agree that the dialogue with the readers is very important so the readers are not only paying you, uh, you have to have some mutual confidence, you have to have these debates which I find very impressive, but at the same time you have to draw lines between the representation and the inclusion of the reader, the response uh, of the editors. Now I have a very, very I feel, delicate issue. Um, you meet sometimes your readers in person, but what happens when you meet them in the digital world? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the misrepresentation mm -hmm. and particularly about the info wars, which Timothy Snyder also talked last night about. So what happens if the representative, representative opinion you have in the commentaries uh, under the articles and they're very selective and sometimes you feel there is something like a campaign against things and particularly as you mentioned it's very often about immigrants, sexuality, sexual violence and so on and it gives the impression of a shift of focus and it's we all know the term is agenda setting. How can you manage that as an editor and also on the technological level uh, to still have a dialogue with the readers, which is very important. We all feel it's not a very good idea just to close the commentary and say no. It's also, moderation is not the only solution because, you know, uh, you can filter out the, the, the aggressiveness, but how you manage a misrepresentation uh, of that opinion, an overrating, so to say. Very difficult question, um, and I'm very bad at um, understanding how to deal with this issue. There's days where you simply sit crying in your room because you don't support this aggressi aggressiveness any longer and don't want to reply to anybody anymore, um, because of course all these readers um, reach you directly, very actively, very directly. 
they just write you an email, they just send you a comment. There is no distance, no, no line. So um, it is very difficult to deal with this aggressiveness. I usually look for an, um, an understanding with my colleagues in order to proceed in a similar way, not in an individual way, um, to build groups, to build rules. Um, and we have now reached in the site um, a new tool which I often use, and this tool allows you not to answer. And you simply press a button and then you have the right not to answer the insult or the aggression or whatever it is. But this is something very new, and I should maybe have said it before, the type of aggression which reaches me now, I didn't even know that existed before, um, let's say the year 2000. Um, anonymously, I want, I mean, and um, personally, aggression which, um, well, is personally addressed to my person, my name. I didn't know that existed before. When you talk about the tool, is, does that mean that you actively put that email that you don't want to answer into some digital archive? Do you do you mark it and then say, I'm not answering this, but f you know, for history to know uh, this, we, I got this email because I just, I have the same problems every day and I just don't answer them. But obviously you're going a step further in that uh, respect too. Yeah, I couldn't explain it technologically. It is simply a, a, a button which I can um, um, push and this answers to my colleagues in the technological department that I'm not going to answer to this comment, so they know. And um, the, um, the reader, um, the, the commenter gets the same answer, that, uh, that he won't get an answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm Zuzia Selenia, I'm from Hungary. And um, a couple of days ago, I'm a fellow here um, in AVM at the moment. Um, a few days ago, we've heard that the Ministry of Interior in Austria uh, distributed a letter to the local police stations um, to warn them not to share information, not basically not to talk to kind of non-friendly media, which was a kind of outrage here it, in, in Austria, which I am not surprised, of course, because this has been long like this in Hungary. Uh, this is a first step to kill any kind of discourse and debate when the power is not engaged itself to even having questions, not, not specifically debate. So we in Hungary are in a stage then when, um, when the participants of the power and, and of course a lot of power-friendly or urban-friendly intellectuals simply don't speak to anyone else. So there is no debate. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost vanished from the Hungarian political arena. It's very specific. There is a 90%, as you said, and of course there's a small, um, let's call open media. Uh, and I've heard, and there is no an initiative of, um, I think it's coming from Austria or probably Germany, um, one of the uh, media try to engage readers to recreate the discourse. So specifically involve people from this kind of decision or opinion on a certain critical issue and another type of opinion. And then they bring these people together in a public space and they discuss. Do you think, is it a role of media to recreate the discourse? Uh, and uh, is this a good way to do this? You mentioned this discussion with the, o with the audience, with the readers, which I find very important and also because of um, a saving democracy purpose. But this is a bit different what I'm saying, that it's actually recreating something which disappeared or disappearing. Well, unfortunately, I've got the impression that all I say is just embrace uncertainty and all I'm trying to do is embracing uncertainty. I don't know the answer, not at all. What I know is that it is a good enlightenment tradition to perceive a journal and the media as mediators. And 
we will never be able to deliver immediacy. That is impossible. We are mediators. So I understand the role, and many others do now, um, as an active challenge to organize the controversies in a society, co to contribute at least to organize these controversies. I would say this is now a challenge for the media, yes, but I understand those who say I am therefore writing brilliant texts and keep my distances to every and each citizen and reader. I understand this very well as well. Maybe we have to go different ways at the same time and understand it as an experiment. Um, democratic experimentalism is my answer to nearly everything at present, but show up and show that you're accountable and that you exist and that you are ready to show up and to show your face and to make your voice heard. Well, to be continued. <laughs> I'm not sure it's, if it's our role to be perfectly honest. I mean, we are watchdogs, we are not community organizers. And I mean, I'll maybe shift the discussion a little bit because I mean, there are maybe in desperate times we need desperate measure. Like in Poland, we have this uh, discussion over which, if journalists can attend demonstration. Are we more journalists or more citizen? If there's demonstration against taking away one of the fundaments of uh, uh, liberal democracy, which is independent judici judiciary. So can we take part in it or not? Can I, as a woman, attend Black March, which is uh, uh, against uh, trying to get uh, take away last remaining right to have a legal abortion in Poland or not? And, you know, some journalists in Poland say, no, we have to be totally impartial, you, can, you are more journalists than citizens. Other go on this demonstration. And you know, in normal times, I would agree with, I think it's New York Times policy that you can never go. You are mostly a journalist, but you know, they're not normal times. But still, I, 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 don't, I don't see media as that kind of organizers. So I'm concerned about a, a certain illusion that I think we're having. Um, the, there's something, you said something about we're living in abnormal times, and I think we are. I mean, everybody feels this. There's something is changing. In, and, and it's certainly the case in America, where United States, where I live. Um, the, the idea that somebody referred, you referred to the Enlightenment, and this idea of expanding discourse and reaching across. There's a book you may know by Ali Hustchild called um, what, Strangers in Their Own Land. And she's got this idea of crossing the wall of empathy. Mm -hmm. She likes this phrase, which she tries to do. She d does it in a very serious way. It's, she's an anthropologist, sociologist, anthropologist. And it's all about figuring out what the supporters of the Tea Party and then eventually Trump voters how they live their lives, to try to get across this wall. And this is a noble ideal. It, you're right, it comes from the Enlightenment. It's, it's the way we, we, liberal democratic people, think. But I think what we actually are seeing, one of the ways in which the times have become abnormal, is that there is a whole idea among politicians I'm thinking now of the United States, Republicans. Look at what just happened with the vote about Kavanaugh. I think you have to face the fact that there is a whole political party in the United States more or less united against this very idea. I mean, one way to put this, I, I like to put it this way, is that I think the polarization which we all see, I mean, you talked about living in bubbles. It's true, we do all live in bubbles. But I think that the politics of it now in the United States, but also elsewhere, is becoming increasingly asymmetrical. That's to say, the idea of the 
in the United States, the idea of Republicans is actually not to uh, think of the of the discourse as something that could be carried on across across the the, the aisle, across the barrier. It's actually to prevent it. You 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 are ac we're actually facing a uh, a world in which the in which the project it's not symmetrically set out. It, it, we're, we're facing actually people who want politics to be a relationship between enemies. And therefore, if that's true, this um, idea that, you know, the, the, the project, let's say in the news newspapers, or let's say among sociologists, anthropologists, is to cross the wall of empathy, you, you have to face the fact that there's a whole political class or segment of the political class that's actually against this very project. I wonder what you think about that. That's, <coughs> that's a very um, well put insight, and, and I tend to agree with you, but I think that that uh, sentiment exists on segments of the left as well, um, especially if you go on college campuses and places like this, and if you go on segments of Twitter. That impulse is bipartisan, actually. I think that it belongs to one political party that governs, more than the other, but that sentiment exists in citizens across po the political spectrum. But it, but I, I agree with your ass assessment 100%. Yes, me too, I agree with you and what you say. And um, once again, I don't have an answer, but I, pragmatically, I would say on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I try to cross the wall and on the other days I stay with me and my friends and um, try to do my very best to find out what I'm thinking myself and not only dialoguing with others. I mean, there's seven days a week. <laughs> I am all for crossing the wall of empathy and trying to see human beings and people we disagree with, but in the age of social media it's getting increasingly difficult. There was this interesting experiment held earlier this year uh, by three American universities. And for a month, uh, they, they used this bot who would give uh, Republican Twitter users retweets of uh, de Democratic politicians, uh, Democratic pundits, Democrats, and the other way around to the Democrats, the Republican ones. So what happened after this month? Do any of them change opinion in any way? No, being expressed to opposite op to views of the other party, but you know, in terms of memes, outrageous voices, and uh, 280 characters uh, made them only more, you know, more co Republicans became more conservative and Democrats became more democratic, because you know, it it's not enough to to show somebody a meme or or be sarcastic or. Uh, or uh, shame somebody into submission. It's not. It it takes a lot of effort. Uh, it, it takes a conversation. It takes uh, being patient and uh, takes humility because you have to give the small space for thinking that you may not be right in everything, which is also very difficult. So this social media a age in which uh, what's pro being promoted is being, you know, fast and and radical. Uh, it doesn't give us much hope to to cross this wall of empathy. Okay, that I think that will bring our session to the a close. And I'd like to thank everyone for turning out this evening, and especially I'd like to thank the three people up here who did most of the talking and reflecting. Thank you.